welcoming you back for another uh, another fun video where we're gonna uh, learn about some great uh, great music. Now we've had so much fun with you the past three weeks um, exploring some some of the great melodies written for orchestra, like Beethoven's Ode to Joy, uh, some music in Dvorak's New World Symphony, and Copland's uh, Appalachian Spring. The melody "Simple Gifts" in that. Um, and that's been really fun for us to do to coordinate with you all with the Carnegie Hall's Link Up program. Um, but now we're kind of off on our own and we've got such a positive response that we wanted to keep these videos going. And so I thought what we've been doing is, is having you all sing and play along with Chloe on the harp. And I figured, well, for today, why don't we just focus on the harp and get to let, help you get to know the instrument uh, a little bit better and uh, just have some fun today learning about one of the great composers that wrote for the harp, uh, Claude Debussy. So, uh, Chloe, uh, will you take us through some of the amazing aspects of the harp and how you perform on it? Yeah, sure thing. Um, it's going to be really fun exploring this instrument. I know a lot of you have maybe never seen one in real life, or maybe if you have, it's been far away at the symphony. Um, so hopefully this video will help you get closer to the harp and know a little bit more about it. So next time you see it on stage at the symphony, um, you feel more confident in knowing when to listen for it and how to listen for it because I know a lot of people often say, oh, I can't hear the harp because it's so soft in the orchestra, but that's not always true. So yeah, I'm going to walk you through all the special effects that we can do on the harp. It's just really an amazing instrument. Sounds great. Let's do it. One of the first things you might be wondering about the harp is how many strings this thing has. It looks like a lot, I know, but I used to think a harp has like a million strings. This harp has 47 strings, as does this harp, which is the same type of harp as this one. They're both called concert grand pedal harps. Concert grand meaning they are the largest, fullest, most standard size of harp. Um, most harps are uh, 47 strings or fewer. There's a few special models in the world that have a few extra strings, but those are very standardly used. Some beginners might start on a harp that's smaller, maybe with levers along the top instead of foot pedals along the bottom. I'll get into what those do later. There's also Celtic harps, which are even smaller. They're usually like what you would think of as a lyre, um, something that you might sit on a stool in front of you while you play. Anyways, um, I said I would get back to the, the pedals, which you may have noticed me playing in this video and maybe in previous videos. There are seven foot pedals along the bottom of the harp. They correspond with a different pitch, and there are three possible slots for each pedal. There is flat, which is the highest, uh, natural, which is in the middle, and sharp, which is on the bottom. Now, you don't hear any changes happening because it is controlled um, it is controlling, sorry, the mechanism that runs through the entire column of the harp. There are seven rods, one for each pedal, that run through the entire length of the column and then work their way down the neck of the harp and change these discs here. So as I control these pedals, the C pedal, for instance, which my left foot is on right now, it will change all of the C strings, the red strings, at the same time, from flat to natural, to sharp. So one string can sound in like three different notes. That's the main difference between the harp and the piano. Without these pedals, we would only have the white keys on the piano. The pedals help us get the accidentals or the in-between notes, the sharps and flats, that we otherwise wouldn't have. So even though we only have 47 strings, we have almost the same range as a concert grand piano with 88 keys. You might be wondering where an unusual instrument like this comes from. Is it old? Is it new? Well, there's a lot of questions there and a lot of history as well. The harp is one of the oldest instruments ever in the world. I mean, other than the voice and maybe the flute, the harp has been around probably longer than any other instrument. It came from the ancient hunters with bows and arrows and you can kind of figure out where it went from there. This harp is actually relatively new though. The modern harp has only had its patent for the last 100 years, complete with the pedals and the mechanism at the top. This harp was built about four years ago. Harps tend to depreciate in value, unlike violins and cellos, which tend to appreciate with value over the years. So while this harp was quite expensive, it's nowhere near the price of a Stradivarius violin. This harp was manufactured in Chicago, Illinois at one of the largest harp manufacturers in the world and the only harp manufacturer in America, Wyman and Healy. It's pretty amazing how they put together the entire harp in their factory. I highly recommend taking a free tour the next time you're in Chicago. The harp is made out of a couple of different types of wood. The soundboard is made out of a very soft pine wood, which is super resonant. 
the back, back of the harp, this uh, box here, this is made out of uh, maple. There's all sorts of different types of maple that you can get your harp made out of, but this one has a nice tiger stripe finish on it. The rest of the harp, you can tell, is also made out of maple, and of course, there's all this metal mechanism here. What makes the harp sound so resonant? Like, what helps it help it? You know, helps it project its sound. Sure. I mean, the harp's sound comes primarily from the soundboard. So, a soundboard is super even and picked up very carefully. This harp is going to have a really great sound. I got lucky with this instrument. You might be wondering what the strings are made of on the harp. The lowest strings are made out of wire-wrapped coils that surround a cloth-like cotton interior, much like thread. The middle strings, and going up into the upper parts of the harp, are made of gut strings, which come from real cows. Gut strings are often manufactured in the UK. A fun story about gut strings is a few years ago, they had upped the regulations in the UK due to mad cow disease. A lot of the strings were starting to run out, so harpists started to stockpile strings, much like how we're stockpiling toilet paper today. The upper strings are sometimes nylon strings or synthetic strings. They look very similar to gut strings. I personally prefer gut all the way up to the top for the sound, but some harpists prefer the brighter, plinkier sound of nylon strings. The colors on the strings actually correlate to the pitch. So as I mentioned before, C's are the red strings, D, E, F's are the black strings, and then G, A, and B. And the octave repeats itself over and over and over again. So it's not because I don't know what strings are which, but it's just a helpful visual guide that all harpists have. some of the, the amazing effects you can get on the harp, like uh, like some of the ones that were just in this. Sure, yeah. You might have noticed the most classic harp effect in this video, which is the glissando. It's just dragging your fingers up and down the strings. And using the pedals, I can actually produce a glissando in a number of ways. So that was, that was a glissando with five flats in it. If I change the pedals just slightly to two different sharps and all naturals, you hear something quite different. So listen to how the harp sounds different as I change the pedals and move to different keys in the glissando. So you can see how the harp is pretty cool in terms of creating different sounds and chord structures with the glissando. Um, one of the other bigger effects that I used in that cadenza were chords and different types of chords. We can either roll chords, which is going from the bottom up to the top of the chord, or keeping them flat. Which means just striking all the notes at once. Pianists do this as well. Um, another cool effect, which I did not use in this cadenza, is the pre de la table effect, PDLT for short, which means close to the table, pre de la table. That means you uh, play the strings very close to the soundboard, and it sounds almost gu guitar-like in effect. Um, compared to what it would sound like in the middle. Tell there's quite a bit of a difference there. Sometimes we use that in orchestra pieces, sometimes we use it in solo pieces to make it sound more uh, Latin and flair. There's also uh, harmonics, which are one of my favorite effects. It's shortening the string with the knuckle of your hand or the base of your other hand, and you basically cut the string in half using your skin and strike it at the same time to create a bell-like sound that actually sounds an octave higher than where you play it.
that you're closing it off with your finger. Yeah. Is that right? I so am. you're you're placing your finger about halfway, or is it halfway in the string, mm -hmm. right? And then you're plucking above it with your thumb. Right. So it taps really fast. Yeah, so I kind of hook it hook the the finger into the string as I, I play with the, the the thumb. And it has to be just right. If it's too high or too low, the harmonic won't sound correct. So you have to kind of judge exactly where that middle point of the string is every time you do harmonics. Now, one of the other things I'm noticing is you're not, you don't put all five of your fingers on all the strings, right? So how does that work as far as like the technique of how you're using your fingers? Sure. Um, so the harp, we only use uh, four of our fingers on each hand, not our pinkies. Just because the way the hand falls on the strings, the pinky would have to work a little extra hard in order to make it to the string. And quite frankly, we can do plenty with just four fingers on each hand. So even though we read piano music, we don't always play the exact same things that pianists can play, both because of the complications with pedals and also we only use eight of our fingers. Some of our listeners might recognize that piece. Yeah, that's a very famous part of uh, the Nutcracker Ballet, The Waltz of the Flowers Cadenza. It was actually my introduction into the harp um, because my parents took me to the Nutcracker every single year as a kid um, over Christmas time. And I just remember hearing the harp sound wafting up from the pit in that moment every year. And so how did you end up getting started playing the harp? Sure. Um, I mean, I wish I could say I was just airdropped in the orchestra pit and the rest is history, but um, actually it's a lot com more complicated than that. Um, the, I started actually with the piano at five years old, which is probably the best instrument to start um, if you're looking to start any other instrument. I guess all your fundamentals from playing music and reading music come from starting with the piano first. So the harp is actually very similar to the piano in many ways. And when I first got to see a harp up close in person, um, I was nine years old and there was a woman playing the harp and I asked her if I could try to play the harp, me being very audacious at nine years old with uh, all four years of musical <laughs> experience at that point. Um, to me, this harp actually just looked like an inside out baby grand piano. I figured it, it can't be all that different. And it's actually pretty close to the inside of a piano if you just, you know, moved it right side up. Um, obviously we strike the, the strings ourselves, we don't have like a hammer striking them like in a piano, but it's quite similar. So I was actually able to pluck out Ode to Joy, which was our first video that we did together, ironically enough, um, but I was able to pluck it out by ear and the rest is history. We're going to meet one of my favorite composers today, the French composer Claude Debussy, born in 1862. Now, you might already know some of his music. He wrote a very famous piece called Claire de Lune. Uh, Chloe, could you play a little excerpt and remind us? music called Impressionism uh, at the end of the 19th century. And you can hear even in this piece these uh, kind of transparent uh, textures and you know really intricate harmonies. Um, and when I think of it, you know, just like the colors, if, if, I, if I thought of lots of different colors in music, I always think of Impressionism. And you actually can almost relate it to Impressionism in the art world, like the paintings of Claude Monet. 
Now, we, I want to talk about Debussy today because not only is he one of my favorite composers, but he was very important in the history of the harp, um, in, in how it's played, but also in its place in the orchestra. So, um, Chloe, first, can you tell us about uh, Debussy's amazing relationship with the harp? Sure, yeah, actually, um, so Debussy was commissioned by the harp company that patented the pedal lover harp to basically write a piece that showcases all these amazing things we can do with the pedals and like making it you know, a fully chromatic instrument and exposing all the possibilities of the harp. So this piece was called um, The Dances, Dac Dances Sacre in Profane. It's actually a concerto for harp and orchestra, a small chamber orchestra, strings only. But there are some parts of it that sound really great solo. One of the parts that are, the only part that I will be demonstrating for you today is a part from the second dance, Dance Profane, which is kind of known as the dream page by harpists. It's very dreamy and whimsical, but you can hear those sort of pointillistic, transparent lines through it that's very reminiscent of impressionist painting at the time. Would you agree? Yes, absolutely. All right, well, thanks for playing a little for us. by Debussy is a work called La Mer, which is translated to The Sea. Uh, it's an incredible three movement piece that Debussy wrote that celebrates the kind of the ocean, the sea, and how it looks at different parts of the day. Now, at the end of the first movement, I think is an example of, of just what makes Debussy so incredible and how he uses all the different instruments, including the harp, at the end of the first movement, where we start with this kind of calm um, ocean, these calm waves, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and you can hear them crashing up against the rocks in the end of this first movement. And the way he uses the harps, the way he uses um, some of the percussion instruments and, and then the brass instruments to kind of grow this piece uh, is really quite remarkable. So let's give it a listen and just hear the end of this first movement. favorites for a lot of reasons. It really showcases the harp, especially the modern harp with all the pedals. The interesting thing about this is there are two adjacent strings on the harp that sound exactly alike. It's an F sharp and a G flat, which to anyone who knows music out there, they know that that actually sounds the same as a pitch. It's an, an harmonic. So in the excerpt, you hear a repeated note at the beginning of each little group of five notes. <laughs> I have 
have to adjust. And it's the same strings, but it's a different collection of pitches. So you sort of see how one tiny pedal can actually make a huge difference in the sound of the harp. So now we're going to try putting it together. I'll play on top the orchestra part, and you can really hear how the harp sparkles through. Yeah, and it adds so much. You can hear the glissandos um, mm -hmm. in the music and, and all the different effects, some of the ones we've been talking about today, that WC uses to really um, let the harps add to the effect of the music. So you can really see how a composer like Debussy really embraced everything that the harp can give to music. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening to and kind of hearing what the harp sounds like on top of the rest of the orchestra. Uh, Chloe, do you have something else like that to show us? Sure. Um, I don't have anything that I'm going to do for you right now, but I actually have a video back from the summer at the Tanglewood Music Center where I was a fellow last summer, and we did the entire opera, Die Valkyrie, by Wagner, one of his operas in the Ring Cycle, of course. And I actually filmed uh, part of a rehearsal from my music stand of uh, the famous Ride of the Valkyries, which you probably recognize from countless things. Movies, Lots of cartoons. Movie <laughs> tunes, yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah, you can please enjoy this uh, video clip from the summer. Yeah, it's a really great bit. And one of the things I really love about this is because it's looking right back at Chloe. You can see how hard a musician has to work in an orchestra as far as you can see where she's looking at the instrument, at the music, at the conductor, the way she's having to listen to all the people around her. Um, you get a sense for how intense things are when you play in an orchestra to make all of this great music. So check this out. <laughs> we've always had you play along with Chloe on the harp. So what, what can we do today together? Um, I think America the Beautiful is a nice tune that a lot of people know. That sounds good. Um, I will see how I do. <laughs> All right, everyone. Here is America the Beautiful. For two harps. For two harps. Anyone and anyone, everyone who else is playing. <laughs>
this. Um, always so much fun to have you guys joining us. Thanks again. Uh, next week, what are we going to look at next week? Oh, next week is going to be theme and variations. Um, I thought we would take a look at a form in music. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do is look at how composers um, build music. And so with theme and variations, it's a, it's a very famous form where you have a, a theme, you know, a melody, and then a composer shows off how they can vary it and change it over time. And so we'll look at, um, we'll actually look at a theme and variations based on the very first piece that you heard in this video, that very first melody that Chloe played. We're going to look at that next week and how that's turned into variations. We're also going to look at how uh, great composers uh, wrote variations like Elgar and Rachmaninoff. Um, so it should be great fun and we look forward to having you back here. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe and well everyone. Take care.